And we are back. And if you're joining us right now, we are just getting our first conversation for this morning started. And as we said before the break, we are going to be looking at some of the legal considerations behind the possible implementation of uh, mandatory vaccinations in Belize for COVID-19. And uh, joining us for this discussion to shed some light on those uh, legal considerations, we are joined by Professor Rosemarie Bell-Antoine, who's joining us via Zoom from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Professor Antoine is a labor law and offshore financial law uh, professor at the University of the West Indies and international legal, legal consultant. Uh, good morning, Professor Antoine. Good morning. Nice to be here, back in Belize, sort of. So, <laughs> and, um, and it's nice to um, have you join us. We uh, definitely appreciate the invitation. Um, and uh, as uh, some of our viewers might not know, you're one of my former professors, so it's also nice to catch up as well. <laughs> Great. It's always nice when my students do so well. Aww. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> But um, speaking to on the topic at hand, um, I think one of the, or where perhaps we can start is um, just in the context of mandatory vaccinations, really, um, a lot of people like to frame this discussion sort of in the context of rights and, you know, whether the government has the right to do it or whether the gov or, or um, whether any personal rights will be, you know, infringed by, by making a mandatory vaccine. So, I'm um, wondering if we can start there, with, uh, uh, starting with the discussion about uh, rights in general and how, how they work in, in this sort of a context. Sure. So I think it's, it's accurate that this is or can be about rights, certainly when you're talking about the state. Yeah. We say government, but it's really the state. Uh, there are a number of rights involved if you are going to try to compel someone to take a vaccine, your personal liberty, uh, your privacy, it might even be your religion as the case may be. Mm -hmm. But rights, even the rights that are protected in our constitutions are really not absolute. We live in a social contract so that we, our rights can be limited for the greater good. Or as the constitution puts it, including your constitution, the public interest. So there's a public interest limitation provided that it's a reasonable action on the part of the government. So there will always be that question, is it a reasonable response to limit rights? And if obviously if you don't have to limit rights, because we should always start from the premise that we should try to secure as many rights as we can. I mean, I'm also a human rights attorney. Mm -hmm. So usually I'm speaking in favor of rights. Um, so yes, we start off with the premise that it should really be the last resort to limit rights, even when it's in the public interest. Yeah. And then it also has to be a proportionate response. So there's another way to go about achieving the objective. And the objective here, of course, is health and safety, protecting the public's health in terms of COVID in, in what is by any measure a crisis of huge proportions. It is only then that we can justify limiting rights. Um, so we always have to balance rights and then it's not just the individual right that we're talking about here, the individual right of someone who says I don't want to be vaccined. It's also the right of the collective, so the collective rights of the society and also I would suggest in some uh, context the right of persons who are pro-vaccine. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to work for instance and I want to be protected and I know that there are people around who are not vaccinated, how is that endangering me? Or if I have to go to a restaurant and the staff is unvaccinated, how does that affect me? So it's a whole host of rights that are competing and we have to balance them as a first principle. Yeah. Well, what's, what's your opinion on that? Because I do think that's such a great starting point. We've heard people champion the idea of uh, their human rights being infringed upon as both sides of the argument, as a member of society, I should be able to get on a bus and not have my health threatened. And also yeah. as a person who doesn't want to get vaccinated, I should have a choice about what goes into my body. How and that's why I started off by saying, yes, we have rights, but these rights are never absolute. Yeah. 
they must be balanced. So you, you a court, and even if we hopefully we don't have to get to a court, when you consider what human rights jurisprudence is about, it's always about balancing rights, competing rights and interests. And I would want to suggest that in this particular context of COVID, when you balance it, when you weigh it, is no doubt in my mind that the right of in relation to the public interest will win out. Yeah. So we have enough precedent, we have enough constitutional provisions, including in your own constitution, yeah. that would suggest that when you do balance these rights, that in the end it will be justifiable from a constitutional point of view yeah. to limit rights in favor of a vaccine. And and the reason is because of the, the danger, the clear and present danger that is um, really presented to, to, to the entire society. So your constitution, for example, specifically mentions public health. Yeah. yeah? So public health is a justifiable reason. It, it would be considered to be reasonably required would be to limit rights because of public health rationales. And also, more interestingly, and not all constitutions do this, but your own constitution in Belize also specifically mentions infectious diseases. You can limit rights in order to contain those. So section five, for example, of your constitution talks about personal liberty. You can, that can be limited to try to contain and prevent the spread of an infectious disease. And the, 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 the notion of health, the word health, mm -hmm. is mentioned nine times. Wow. in your constitution. So it, all kinds of rights can be limited uh, in favor of the public's health or general health, including freedom of movement, property, religion even, even your right to work, which is unique to Belize. Mm -hmm. So there's enough justification. And also, um, I think we know that we've had a long history of mandating vaccines for children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes. that came from a case long ago in 19 of fire Jacobson and it's been upheld in many many instances and recently coming back up again that if it is necessary to do so yes it can be justified and with that said um, on the on the issue of, of the reasonableness um, of that of, of the response how do we assess or determine what is going to be a reasonable response in in, in the particular circumstances right. Great. So we know that um, I mentioned the word proportionate because proportionality is a principle. Although the Constitution specifically mentions these exceptions, and as I said, I think it is fairly easy to justify. Modern courts always talk about is it proportionate, meaning is there another way you can achieve the objective without infringing on rights? And so what I would suggest it comes down to is the issue of risk. How risky is it? if you don't vaccinate, if you do nothing, if the state does nothing, if the employer does nothing, is it too great a risk? Is there too great harm? And I think that's where the science comes in because this is one of the instances where law will work in tandem with the science, the medical data. And unfortunately, I don't mean the theories out there because we know there are many, we need to look at the orthodox science or the established science, what WHO is seeing, for instance. That sort of um, science, which is sort of more traditional. Um, so if they will base the question of risk and the question of harm on that established science. And what does the science tells us? It tells us that the only way to get out of the pandemic, really, is to get herd immunity through vaccination and it's, and it's a lot of vaccinations we need. It's not just 10%. It started off, I think, 70% is now 90%. Huh? They're saying with the new variants, Delta, that the only way we can beat this will be through the vaccine so that, yes, we have masks. Yes, we have um, social distancing and we need to do all of those. But the question we have to ask, even if we were to do this and we are doing it already, is it sufficient? to really contain and move away because we've been this thing almost two years now. Mm -hmm. So that is where I think it, is, is it, is it, it therefore becomes a reasonable action yes. and it becomes a proportionate one. Yeah. So a couple of months ago, Belize as well as Trinidad, it's quite a few of the countries in the region 
we kind of thought we had this thing beaten. You know, it wasn't, it, we didn't see a huge, it seemed to be okay, we were containing it, I think. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden... Here comes Delta. Yes. <laughs> yep. So, I, I mean, I, I, as I said, I'm a human rights advocate. I would always want to go first with individual human rights, but yes. we have to look at the context of what is happening. And, and see it not as coercion or as something punitive, but as something to protect us. And I think that is where the reasonableness will come in. Let me uh, step back for a moment and talk about uh, your decision to, to publish uh, one of the first legal opinion in this region um, on mandatory vaccinations and the response that you've gotten so far. <laughs> well, in nature, that's an interesting question because just yesterday I was saying, oh, I see everybody's jumping on the bandwagon because from early in the year, uh -huh. and of course I'm at the university, I was a dean at the time, yeah. I'm not pro vice chancellor, but we were in management and we had to consider the issue of students, some medical students in hospitals. So I, I was very strong, no, they need to be vaccinated if you're going in the hospitals and so on. So I'd been thinking about this even before then. Unfortunately, I knew we would get to this point. Mm -hmm. The writing was on the wall and I thought we would at some point rather soon, we would have to be thinking about this issue. And this is why I decided in the, as a public service, because that's part of what academics do, to, um, you know, to not just talk about it, but to start writing a bit about it. Initially, um, even the lawyers, everybody was, oh, rights, rights, there's no mandatory law, so we can't do anything. No, it's on, it's, no, it could never happen. Um, but I think it is clear to see that the cases that we have so far have um, basically endorsed yeah. what i was saying even before so we've now had the bridges case that was the first case in texas that came after my opinions um where the healthcare workers were the the court throughout the methodist hospital they said no you can be compelled to be vaccinated high risk and again what i was saying there about risk the higher the risk the more justified the mandatory vaccine and more recently we've had these cases again from the US um, in terms of the university compelling students and then across the world little by little government states were deciding to compel whether directly or indirectly yeah because um you know there's more than one way to to to, to bear the cat is it mm. <laughs> yeah. oh yes but at first we we i i was sort of the odd man out but i'm used to that <laughs> <laughs> i talked about right to privacy we said oh no cannabis which is the last time i visited Belize, was on cannabis uh -huh. so i'm used to being um a little odd man out until things change and now we see a lot of attorneys giving opinions and so forth yeah. um, and basically agreeing and saying yes they agree it's justified in law so i'm happy about that but i have also said that um it is not i would have liked to have seen let us say more involvement with the unions yeah. the discussion and so on because it is obviously a sensitive question yeah. and really this is something i had hoped we could have come to in relation to consensus yeah. and educating people. But unfortunately, it's been very difficult to counter the internet, etc. Just So to here we are. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I thought you were. Yeah, just to follow up though, uh, that, that is the, the legal opinion that you've published. Is your personal opinion the same that the route that should be taken within individual nations is mandatory vaccination? Yes, but I mean, I, I don't, I think we need to be clear what mandatory vaccination is. It is unlikely that we can simply say, um, all right, everybody um, be vaccinated just outright like that. I think what governments are doing little by little is probably the best approach for now, which is to say you can't access certain services, what I have called soft law. Mm. I call that soft law, but it's still compulsory and we do it already with yellow fever, for instance. Mm. You know, nobody tells you you must have a yellow fever a vaccine, but you can't travel That's true. if you don't have it. So I think it's, as I say, I come to the table very cautiously being a human rights advocate, but I see no way out. And not only that, the more longer we delay, what concerns me, the longer we delay, the more lives we lose. Because I think it is now so clear that it is really a, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Every day is more clear. It doesn't mean that somebody who's 
vaccine, they, they never get sick. No, it doesn't mean that. But it, the, the risk is so minuscule compared to persons who are unvaccinated. And not only that, I think the longer we delay, the, the worse for our economy because employers are afraid, or, or, or if they're not afraid to open up without vaccination, they are also uh, um, afraid of the costs. You know, the, how, mm -hmm. how not just how risky it is for their own jobs, but all of the costs involved. If people get ill, if people are quarantined, if some of the public liabilities, all of this uncertainty. So we are actually delaying yeah. getting our economies back on track. And, you know, and that is also a factor that courts would look at, by the way, here yeah, on mm -hmm. new hardship. So this is why I am reluctantly, perhaps, and let me just say to you that um, you probably don't know, but I was in a very um, life-threatening accident on December 31st, ODSD, last year. So I'm actually still recuperating wow. and I am still compromised in terms of my whole system. And I was nervous to take the vaccine because of the blood clot issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I, especially the AstraZeneca, which was an offer. And I, oh, goodness, suppose. And when I waited, I had to think, well, okay, what is worse? Me getting COVID in this situation, so vulnerable physically, or taking the vaccine with the one in million chance of a blood clot? So I had to make that personal decision. So I do understand people's concerns, and I took the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But I am not sure that I'm seeing a choice. If tomorrow the science says something different, yes, I'll be the first to say, Leave it alone. But where? What is the choice? To do nothing? Mm -hmm. and, I don't think. And uh, you, you said something. Um, you spoke about soft law, and you also spoke earlier. Um, uh, touched a little bit on the difference um, with uh, uh, um, in the public and private context. So, can you uh, talk a little bit more about that uh, and which different considerations might apply? For example. We've been speaking sort of from a constitutional what the government um, yes. can do, but also if you're a if if you're a private employer and you perhaps want to to, to you may be wanting to make it your policy, uh, what what considerations might apply um, in that context? Sure, Gavin. And as you can see, Gavin is a very good student because you know <laughs> one of the things that I found so odd when this discussion started, even lawyers were talking about human rights at the workplace, and I'm thinking, but goodness, that is not uh, uh, that can't happen, and we don't have constitutions that apply to the private sphere, yeah. except to make a change there a bit. Um, so yes, so it's a different conversation. Altogether, it has it will come down to the labor law principles. In some cases, maybe even admin law, etc. Um, and again, reasonableness, but also contractual terms. Um, and ultimately, again, it's a question of risk, but in relation to the employer's duty to protect health and safety. So there, we can't be talking about rights of privacy and personal liberty doesn't exist. Yes. except to the extent that Jamaica changed their constitution um, to apply in some spheres in the private. So that um, w the employer's duty to keep the workplace safe and to keep the employees safe, mm -hmm. and also the employer's duty, the employee's duty, to, to act in such a way as not to endanger the health and safety of co-workers. That's where we come down to. And there's some discussion as to whether you know, you're changing terms and conditions of employment. No, you're not because these are, these are already inherent in the contractual relationship, those duties of health and safety. So we, I started off um, a few months ago by saying, okay, at the very least, the high risk workplaces or high risk environments. Yeah, so there are some obvious ones, the hospitals, people who are interfacing with the public, restaurants and so forth. Some of men, people are, talk a lot about the tourist industry and that's important especially when you consider the issue I mentioned before on new hardship. If I don't vaccinate, I'm a hotel. Is anybody likely to come and stay in my hotel? Mm -hmm. Most likely not. So what do I do? Go out of business? Mm -hmm. um, but um, what I would say is that that broad duty of health and safety insulates the employer <clears throat> if he or she decides to say, look, you need to take a vaccine to work here. Because I think now more and more it is difficult to distinguish what is a high risk and what is a low risk environment because of the Delta and the other strains. They are just so rampant and so rabid and um, contagious. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 that distinction between high risk and low risk, in my view, is fast disappearing, unfortunately.
Um, but so yes, I think the employer can do that and it will be considered proportionate. The ticklish part, of course, is um, the question of sanctions mm -hmm. and penalties. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, but it's not necessarily a, a, I mean um, it's not necessarily a, a, a new issue because I think you um, you had also mentioned earlier about the policy what the policy would be regarding students and um, as we were speaking it also uh, brings to mind that um, it's in the context of schools and on other institutions we've seen where um, vaccinations have been required in order to, to, to be admitted to certain programs yes, or... Yes, the... yes, yes. But that was by law, that is by the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the context of the employer, you, the, probably the closest analogy is that even before you get a job, for almost all jobs, you have to have a medical. So health and safety is always there, even apart from the, the terms and conditions, implied terms and conditions of, of work. It's always something that the employer says to you, you have to be healthy and, and fit, you have to be fit for work, etc. So it's, I don't think it's anything new that, that that is something that we consider at the workplace. Can it work in the reverse? If I'm a high risk patient and vaccination is not mandated in my workplace and it's a high risk environment? Um, if you are high, yes. And I, and well, yes, two things that we started off saying about it's not just the in the persons who don't wish to be vaccinated that we need to listen to there are many who wish to be vaccinated and who wish to be safe and their voices are not as loud but just as important and they're probably in the majority although we haven't taken a poll mm -hmm. and yes so why um and most of us have legislation which and if we don't have legislation it's part of the common law which is that i have a right to not work if it is that the, the workplace is too risky in terms of my health and safety. Mm -hmm. So I can say I'm not coming to work because should I come to work, my health will be endangered. So if a, a person who wants to be safe and his co-workers are, are saying no and, and probably not even wearing their mask, well, hopefully that doesn't happen in the, in the Caribbean, it's more in the States. Mm -hmm. And I'm really so, sad to hear the story I was listening this morning about the person who was shot that yeah. Again, shows you the extreme situation we are in, and we need to get back to some kind of normalcy. Yeah. Um, but yes, so I think you could you could be faced with that. The employer could be faced with that. That some some persons could say, "Well, I'm not coming to work unless everybody is um, vaccinated." Or a, a, a more common scenario, what it happened to me, I am not allowing anybody to come to my house and render services to me in my case caregiving physio and all of that unless you are vaccinated mm -hmm. because you are endangering my life and i didn't have physio for a couple of months and so forth yeah. um I, I still don't have a housekeeper for instance yeah. um, for those sorts of things so yes of course have we seen any any legal challenges as yet to I, I think you call them softer laws where basically you give people a choice you get vaccinated or you prove um, that you are COVID negative. Uh, there's been uh, considerations made or discussions had locally that uh, this in itself can be challenged in the courts. Have you seen any across the region? Yeah. Um, I saw a threat in Trinidad by the unions, but so far I don't know if it has gone forward. But just last week, I think it was, in fact, in fact over the weekend, sorry, our prime minister announced that he will be, at first I thought, I'm sorry, I have a little hiccup. Mm -hmm. I thought at first I thought that he was saying it was happening now, but I think he said he will be mm -hmm. implementing that for restaurants and gyms, I believe, next month. Yes. Um, so I think the Facebook, there are people saying, oh, dictatorship sort of thing. But then interestingly, a couple of lawyers came out, including one or two ones who are known for human rights as well, like Ramesh Maraj, who, who said, yes, that's perfectly fine with the, the whole soft law. And we know countries, whole countries have done that. France has done it, Canada has done it, New York has now done it. So little by little, I think in the Caribbean, all around us, this is happening more and more. So, uh, you know, we may have challenges. We have to be clear. People may challenge in courts and they have the right to challenge. They challenge anything. They can challenge a mask wearing as they did in the United States, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but the question is, is it likely to stand up in court? And I don't think it is likely to stand up. I think these would fail. Um, but 
we obviously we have to be prepared. Some employers might be a little scared because they don't wouldn't want to be the one to be the test case. Mm -hmm. So it is probably better for the, the state to, to outline a policy to sort of protect the private sector. Because I know I, I have been talking to chambers of commerce and so on. I know they, they are a little scared of doing these things because, you know, they don't want to be challenged in court, even though they know they might win or whatever. It's not a nice thing to have to deal with that. Mm. So that's where we are uh, at the moment. And um, something also which you touched on a little bit earlier, um, which I think you said was a sticky situation, and that was to, what, what are the penalties for if such if such a policy is going to be enacted, whether at, you know at the government level, what what is going to be the response for persons who who choose not to be who choose right. not to be vaccinated? Sure. So I'm a little soft on this one, I guess. <laughs> my bleeding heart coming out here. Um, so clearly we have to have exceptions. One is religion, the other is genuine medical reasons, you know, so some people cannot take the vaccine. Yeah. So that's fine, that's, that's, that's what we there. So persons who just simply don't want to. Um, I don't rule out dismissal. Huh? I'm not saying you cannot dismiss, that cannot be. But what I am saying to employers and the governments and so on is that it has to be approached really very cautiously and again as a last resort. So what I would suggest if somebody doesn't want to be vaccinated, they can. If they can work at home um, re and you can accommodate them without affecting your bottom line because we, we have to consider the, the, the functionality of the workplace and so on then we can choose that option, the, the sort of the, the, let us say, the more humanitarian option. Um, but in some cases, this cannot work or it cannot be sustained. And the other things you can do, um, so for example, some we, we've now adopted this term called furlough all over the world, which is not something we had in our UK system before. But you can have the option of laying off temporarily that person, you know, um, that I think would be justified as well if they cannot be accommodated. But as a last resort, if it is that dismissal has to take place and you've gone through the due process, you've um, shown that you've tried to accommodate, you've tried to do this, you've tried to do that, then yes, dismissal is, is, is a, an option. I know some persons feel that, okay, too bad, dismissed. And that is what the Bridges case said, by the way, in America, that um, you, know, you don't have to work here, so too bad for you. You don't want to be vaccinated you'll be dismissed and that was the end of the story but we do know that in the in the states the dismissal laws there's less protection in dismissal law there but i think here for us we need to uh, approach that more cautiously interestingly your constitution you know you are the only constitution well Guyana has a little bit but your constitution talks about the right to work as you probably know section 15 a very unique and um, exciting provision for a labor lawyer like myself, mm -hmm. but um, that is also limited in terms of of, of um, uh, in terms of health, public health. So your constitution specifically says that you can limit the right to work. So hmm, you can see that you're not on a very strong ground if you simply object and say I don't want to be vaccinated. Yeah. So the employer will probably try their best to to see what else can be done and so on, but. Let us say too many people are doing that, it may become impossible. So he may he or she may have no choice but to say sorry. I have to let you go. That's interesting. Now I, I appreciate your point of view in saying, you know, that uh, dismissal should be the last resort. And I know there are quite a few employers who are happy for this clarity. What what are some of the gray areas um, that you think uh, you have been noting in this discussion about mandatory vaccinations? Right. Well, most of the, there are lots of areas generally with COVID and labor law, yeah? um, a whole host of things that have cropped up. But in terms of vaccination, one of the things that I'm still mulling over in my mind, I'm leaning towards one view, but the whole thing of who pays for the quarantine and so forth, mm -hmm. in, um, if people don't wish to be vaccinated now, the easiest answer is, well, too bad, you pay for it. You have to, if you don't wish to be vaccinated, you have to demonstrate that you're COVID free and you pay for those tests. Mm -hmm. And you also pay for any quarantine that you may end up with, you know, that you had to be quarantined, etc. But then, um, 
you know, there's a little blurry line because if we say that, yes, there's a duty, the employer has a duty to health and safety in the workplace, you could stretch it and say that that employer may actually have to pay for the test. But we do know that, um, we do know that the employee also has that duty. So it's, it's, it's a uh -huh. bit of a 50 50. Um, I, 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 again, I think the, the jurisprudence as much as it, it exists, Mm -hmm. It's more in favor of the employee having to pay for those things. Yeah. Um, and certainly also the question of sick leave is something, not just the vaccination, mm -hmm. but also generally across the board. That is has become a gray area because sick leave is usually, what, 14 days, 21 days. If you're being quarantined, you may be quarantined more than once. Mm -hmm. You may use up your sick leave what obligations should be placed on an employer yeah so we haven't really we haven't thought seriously about that question yet it is still something that it's evolving yeah uh it can happen in the context of the vaccination because as i said the vac unvaccinated would more likely be quarantined or, mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever but it is those sort of little ticklish questions as to quarantines and paying for tests i think are still a little sure is still out <laughs> Well, it, it, it seems to me that just in general, um, this, this topic, uh, it, it, the consideration or the main consideration will, also, will be like a balance between the individual and the collective. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, w so I, I, so would you say that's generally just a fair assessment? And, and, and based on that, do, um, how do you, I, what are some predictions you might have, you know, just for the region and, and how uh, these policies <laughs> might be um, implemented? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I try to avoid these things, but um, you know, I think little by little, more and more services will be closed if you're not vaccinated, and that, and not only that, airlines I think will, if some are already there, but more so would um, would say you can't fly if you're not vaccinated, and I know so the Trinidadians love to go all over the place. I know some people spread on television and say, well, no, I took the vaccine because I want to go to Canada. Or New York, as it is, maybe. So, you know, there, I think there are few people who are genuinely anti-vaccine or anti-COVID vaccine. I, I think there are a small amount. The, the large majority of people who are hesitant are simply unsure mm -hmm. because of what they're hearing. So they might need a little nudge. So I do think that um, what the soft law approach is probably going to be what we're going to be seeing a lot of, whether it's a university, you uh, to come to class or to live on the halls or whatever. This, the services, the restaurant, the, the tourist industry is of great concern, I think, for most of the region, including Belize. So I think it is likely that that, um, whether the, 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 the government does it or the employers just simply buy the bullet and, and do it, as some of them are doing already. I know in the oil sector in Trinidad, they have said, and these are foreign companies, you have to be vaccinated. So I think the hotel sector, so they will have to do it. They will have to say, look, you must be vaccinated to work here. And little by little, I think we may not get to where a general law saying, like, you know, everybody must be vaccinated. Mm. But you will have these sort of little sectors, know, incremental yeah. Yeah. sort of things where we'll achieve it. But uh, it all depends, of course, on how the the virus. Uh, what is what is the what is happening in Belize? So where are you now? Are We're you in our third like, wave. But and is it worse than before? Like everybody else, um, it's bad. It's not worse than our second wave as yet, but we haven't uh -huh. peaked. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So I think that is part of it too. I mean, the, obviously, the, 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 the more strident the, 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 the pandemic and the, the virus, the, the more people are going to rush to these options. But I do believe that is where we're going to go next. Yeah. And we probably have already started. And we have moral support from other countries. The sort of the soft law approach that, that needs to be taken, which is justifiable in law as well. All right. Um, well, uh, Professor Antoine, uh, with that <laughs> said, we are just about out of time for this uh, discussion, but uh, we definitely want to say thank you for yeah. uh, joining us and, and, sh and shedding some re light on this topic. Um, yeah. are, uh, are there any um, closing words that you'd like to make to our viewers? <laughs> Not really, just to say to stay safe yeah. and let's all pray and hope for the best and thank you for having me. I love Belize. The last time I was there was when we had the 
cannabis and I know Billy's passed your law so you're yeah. one in my good books <laughs> <laughs> so all the best and stay safe one final question professor how did Gavin do are you grading him uh, <laughs> of course you continue yeah. to stay safe bye thank bye. you and with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Minister Kevin Bernard to talk about the latest developments in e-governance legislation. So please stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. <laughs>